mutual dependency. It's almost like an oxymoron. And I've really had to think about this a lot because it's a really big thing of why I, my assumption of one of the big reasons why my husband left. What is mutual dependency? Is it like depending on each other, yet depending on oneself at the same it's, time? It's depending on the other person, so we absolutely, but you're right. Yeah. In the I, I, and the we, we are not only looking for this person to meet our needs. We are taking responsibility for meeting our own needs. That's why it's a hundred, a hundred, and then we bring part of it into the new entity, the vagina, the baby, and we create a we that also will assist in meeting our needs. But it's interesting because so many of us are so against dependency. Well, yeah, when it's like I said on Tuesday, when it turns like this, this is the parasite. A parasitic relationship means what? Biology 101. What was that? When only one person is better than Okay. Well, forget about the person. Take me to biology. When one organism it's is benefiting the living from you. When one organism <laughs> is benefiting, there's a host and there's a parasite. That is not mutual dependency. That's co-dependency. And so, when I first got married, my husband would say, I'm codependent, I'm codependent. And I'd be like, you're not codependent. You're not responsible for meeting my needs. I would say this. I, I, I have a, a vision of us making the bed and him saying I'm codependent. I'd be like, no, you are not responsible for meeting my needs. Like, I must have said this thousands of times over the nine years that we were together. Because in my mind, we were dependent, but we weren't codependent. I had friends. All of those social, physical, mental, spiritual habits that I told you about the other day that you want to make sure that your client has. I had a spiritual life. I had a physical practice. I did yoga every day. I had been a marathoner. I had mental stimulation. I was in school, I was getting my PhD, I finished and I went to classes. What else? Social? I had friends. This was probably the least one until I slowly developed, you know, um, more and more friends. But I had a complete life. So to me, it didn't seem like codependent, it seemed like mutual dependency. But to the other person, if they are the parasite, eventually what happens? What happens? They start feeling alone. Like they okay, they start feeling alone because they don't have the social part. They're not, they're not being like paid attention to. They're not well, I don't agree with that because if you're the host, and the parasite is the only one taking advantage, they're definitely getting paid attention to. What did you say, Tanisha? The emotional part. Okay, well, there already is a weakness. Remember, this concept of the I, I, and the we, if we look at it like cells, this is the cell wall. People, evolution. Go to evolutionary psychology. You can't go wrong. The man gets the tiger, he's exhausted, he throws it on the floor, and he goes snoring on the cave wall. And the woman is like, damn, I gotta skin it, I gotta peel it, I gotta cook it, I gotta move it, I gotta have to make sure that I have enough for everyone's meal tonight plus tomorrow. I gotta cook, I gotta clean, I gotta take care of the kids, and then maybe I get to lay on the cave wall like Mr. over there. Are we still not in the same boat? Oh, yeah. Evolution. Remember I told you about the pinky toe? <laughs> slowly, 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 it's getting smaller. And eventually we won't have a pinky toe. I don't know what the original purpose of the appendix
appendix was? Do you? Does anyone? There is no. Okay, but at one point there had to be. Yes. Science, nature does not invent something that has no purpose. We outgrew it. That's what it was, because we have no... We don't know. We don't know, right, because it was Lord knows how many gazillions of years ago. There is nothing, and I told you this before, I, we did the assignment with Jen when we talked about her butt. Oh, yeah. There is nothing in the body. There is nothing that biology does that's not on purpose. If you are bald, there's a reason. You get some need fulfilled by being bald. Now, are you naturally bald or did you shave? I shave, but I, I've been going bald. Okay. Bald. So there is a need. Remember, the problem is in the solution. The solution is the problem. If you continue to remember that it's all evolutionary psych, and you go back to biology, you're going to get your answer. Parasites don't respect a cell wall. They attach. What does this look like in the human body? The word is on the board. Maybe this is better. And I'm by no means a drawer. We know. Pregnancy. Pregnancy. Can we see that? That's where the moon comes in. The moon is a child. It's the emotions. We're parasites, people. We were parasites. And what was the birth process supposed to make us? Separate. Separate entities. Do you know that in the psychology of children that are C-sections, they don't know that they left the womb? Because when you have a natural birth, they take the baby and they put it on the mother's body, and the baby understands subconsciously that there's a separate entity. But in C-sections, they don't do that. They rush the baby, and then they sew up the mom. The child's psyche, when it's a C-section, doesn't register that it has left the environment, the host. Isn't that fascinating? And another thing that happens with C-section babies, <clears throat> which is correlate, is that they don't develop the gut flora, the microbi microbiome in their GI system, as well as babies that have natural delivery. Because the vagina has the coating, and I'm not using the exact words, you would know more than me, but that bacteria or whatever that coats the baby helps to develop all of the microbiome. So it gives it more immunity. It gives it a better digestive system. And what do we know about the gut? I told you about the vagus nerve. Oh, I'm sorry, it all started. But it's the first brain. They call it the second brain. Oh, I have a gut. This was the first brain and it went up and created the brain. So there is a direct relationship between health physical health, emotional health, mental health, when they're C-section versus natural delivery. Now, my three kids were C-sections. Most kids these days, unfortunately, because the doctor wants to go on his golf trip and wants to not deliver babies at midnight, they're scheduling C-sections like freaking ridiculousness. It's just like when my mom gave birth to me, they used to inject the women so that they wouldn't make breast milk. They would stop the breast milk production because we were feminist and, and you know liberal and now women weren't gonna breastfeed and formula was taking over. Nestle made a killing. So the things that are happening in our time frame of the children and then 20, 30 years later when they're developing certain diseases, everybody now has a GI problem. Everyone is constipated or they have diarrhea. Everybody has IBS. Everybody has Crohn's disease. Everyone's gluten-free. Do you think that's an accident? That's from when the beginning of the C-section craze. It correlates. That's where we need science so we can connect the dots. 
So if this is a healthy relationship in nature, and this is a parasitic one where there's no separation, it's the same idea in relationship. If you and your partner don't have a healthy boundary, then it's not mutual dependency, it's codependency. You need that person or that person needs you to just exist just like a parasite. A parasite cannot exist without its host. So for me, I was clear that we were in a mutual dependency because I had a very full life. But as the years went on, it became very clear to this person that he did not have that same thing. It was his own choice. I did not do anything to cause that. And so when I get diagnosed the first time, his response is, oh my God, if she dies, I don't have a life. My host leaves, then what? And hence the midlife crisis, hence going to find friends, hence going to live on his own, hence moving into a different relationship. Because most people, we talked about this on Tuesday, don't renegotiate. A lot of these theories, especially Sternberg, is about the renegotiation. When the passion decreases, but the compassion increases. Look, you've been married, what, 17 years? Okay, 17 years. You have cycles. There are cycles in relationships. My girlfriend is married 21, 22 years. I've seen the ups and downs. People, there are times that you're in a relationship that you fall out of love with that person, not because you don't love the person. You fall out of that infatuation, erotic love because you've got kids and you've got bills and you've got stress and you're worried about shit. It has nothing to do with falling out of love with the person because you don't love the person. And then you renegotiate and you rekindle romance and you rekindle the passion, and then it dies again. And that's the ebb and flow of relationships. But people are expecting this passion and this eros for every fucking day and year of their life. That is an immature child. That might be a Scorpio cusp. That's one meaning, not only control, but sex for certain people, yes. But there's such thing as controlling a person. Yes, and we talked about that on Tuesday. You're going to hear me okay. on the video. I, I talked about the law of vibration and the law of attraction. Absolutely, you can outgrow someone, and it's all based on the V word. Validation? No. no. Oh. The most important thing in our life, values. Oh. So you'll hear when you watch it that I talk about shared values. So I had a client the other day and he and the girlfriend were fighting, and we had, they're both my clients, and I gave them an assignment. You know when someone offers like tutoring, that they make the tutoring paper, and then they put the little slit so you can rip off the number, you know, for tutoring? <coughs> the, uh, the homework I gave them was to put their shared values on a piece of paper, and then write them little on the little paper. And when they get into an argument, rip off one, and one of the person, there's always one that's more angry than the other, go to the person and go, are we fighting about shared values or are we just fighting ego, personality? If you're fighting about shared values, there's a problem. You are outgrowing that person, that is law of vibration. You're gonna see I talked the whole first okay. hour about that. So absolutely. But if that isn't what's happening, and that was my whole lecture on thread mate versus soulmate. Soulmate is this idea that you've got one person and this person's for bullshit. <laughs> the red mate is where you pick the shared values and you sew, so to speak. That's a saying that I used to say. I would tell my husband, I'm like, oh my God, we're going to have problems at the seven years and I'm going to sew myself to your leg just like Dionysus and Zeus and, well, 
he went away. I have a big gash, so you can't sow yourself to someone if the values aren't shared any longer. It will absolutely disintegrate because you're no longer on the same rung of the ladder. So unless the values have changed, have your core values changed with your husband in 17 years? No. Have you had ups and downs? Not really. Okay. Well, she's, she's exceptional. She's like out of this world. You know, but for the most part. I mean, that doesn't mean I don't get upset and, and you know, and right. we get upset and with each other. And something that happened with them, which is not the norm, is that they got married in their 40s. Right. So they were able to do a lot of this work prior to coupling. Most people don't do that. Including therapy remember, on both ends. Yeah, so that's another reason why they're in more of an adult adult. But that's not the norm. So you will find people like that. There are certain, let's say, my husband and I would argue about stupid things, but really we were like, at least in my eyes, he says, no, but I thought, I thought I was living in a Hallmark movie, you know. So it was that kind of connection. I didn't see it as parasitic. But it was just, there was so much intimacy, love, and compassion. I'm not saying passion, but compassion and intimacy and love. So that comes with time. I was 10 years older. He is very, emo very emotionally mature. I am not. So maybe the 10 years, <laughs> even, even now, as I grew up because of my first cancer, that could, and then he changed we missed each other there but yes you can absolutely outgrow someone definitely and you can also get bored <laughs> you can also get bored and then you're going to marry or date the same person all over again with a different face and a different name because remember it's a mirror so unless you've changed you're going to date the exact same person okay and i mean changing real change so this is mutual dependency, whereas this is parasitic or codependency. Big, big difference. One person in this system has no self, no cellular boundary, no cellular integrity. Forget the word cellular for a second. Take out cellular. In a human relationship, if you have no boundary, no integrity, no self, that's a shit show. That's a shit show. And you're probably going to get a lot of clients in that situation. That's why I'm going to give you the paper of the I, I, and the we so that you can have the five categories of health. What am I missing? Emotion. So when the who says, what are the categories of health or the definition of health, and you can get your client to identify that they have these, then you're like, oh, okay, you're at least somewhat healthy. But if your client cannot, about themselves or their spouse, list and cl clearly state that they have these components of health, they're probably in a parasitic or codependent relationship. And then what's the last stage? Need fulfillment. Can someone meet your needs if the relationship looks like this? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now I'm going to show you something cool about astrology. This is your ascendant. This I told you was the midheaven. This is the IC and this is the descendant. This ascendant is the sign that you're supposed to become. It's your individual self. So for you to get your needs met by someone else, what do you have to be first? Whole and your own individual person. Do you see that no matter what theory, did I tell you about the thing that I saw the other day on LinkedIn and I just kind of giggled? 
there's this neuroscientist from NYU, and I follow him, and I read his stuff, and he's great, and he puts up this picture of this guy, I think in Washington Square in New York, and the guy at the desk had a comment that said, um, the Myers-Briggs is astrology for people with LinkedIn profiles. The Myers-Briggs is basically all about personality yeah. assessment based on Jung, based on archetype, and that's based on astrology. And then he made the comment about LinkedIn, like millennial or people that are professionals. And what's wrong with it? This is all the same thing. No one invented anything new. This is the astrology wheel. This is the sun. These are the aspects of the psyche. These are the archetypes. What's this thing about, oh my God, astrology? Who gives a shit? You name it astrology, you name it Sternberg, you name it Rice or Lee or Yahia or Seven Gates or, you know, Google Gaga. Like, who cares? People get so cut up. Shakespeare said it, a rose is a rose by any other name. If you see a rose, you know it's a rose. And people get so caught up because they want to defend, and I'm all for science, but let's get real. These theories that they've done research on come from this idea. It comes from science. You cannot have need fulfillment unless you are a full individual, unless you are an entire I. You cannot. The other person cannot meet your needs. This is only 50%. The relationship is only an entity that is 50% of the whole thing. That means that 25% of this person and 25% of this person goes to make the relationship. That's it. It is not a whole, it is a whole entity. I told you relationship is a person too, right? But you cannot rob from you to meet the need of another person. So when you do, because we all do, guess who comes out with a vengeance? Inner child. Your inner child, your fifth house cusp, and your inner child says, get the fuck out of town and move to Texas because we need validation because so-and-so asshole didn't buy me a birthday present or didn't remember my anniversary or whatever it was that your thing is. So we are constantly giving away our power and then we're trying to get it back in an immature, childish way. And it's all about needs that were never fulfilled here and have never been and probably will never be in this lifetime fulfilled. So all we can have is what? What's this first step of the Band-Aid? Awareness. Awareness. That's all I could do is know that when I stayed up till midnight last night, although I was sick and although I was tired, I was so excited to apply to hundreds of jobs <laughs> that that was my inner child being impulsive and my job is to track where I violated my needs that day or earlier that week, probably. So if your inner child is acting up, your needs weren't met, Your inner child is an attempt to meet your need because somewhere you violated your need. So if you go back and track where you violated your need, then you can see Oh, that's why I'm applying to jobs. And I know exactly where I violated my need. Because I tracked it last night. Did I still stay up? Sure did. Did I still get impulsive? Sure did. Did I spend money that I didn't want to spend and don't have and don't need to? Sure did. But at least I became aware and tracked 
where in the week I violated my needs. What benefit do we get by tracking where we violated our need? Aside from awareness. Yeah, I mean, what can we do with that awareness? What's the next step of the band-aid? Integrate change. Integrate some change. So, I started my Susie Orman diet today. <laughs> Your balance. Is it going to be forever? Is my inner child going to have an attitude at some point? Is she going to have a tantrum and spend and do shit she should? Of course she is. But at least I can be aware. How do we, re how do we apply this to relationships? Let's say I was in a couple. And last night, I stayed up all night and spent money that I didn't have. You're talking about integrate and change or the awareness? All of it. Oh. How can we, because we're talking about I, I, and the we. So I explained to you what I did with myself. What, how does this show up in a relationship? How does this cause problems and or how do we help clients solve problems by having this information, this tracking, and knowing that we violate our inner child and so forth? Because of how you said on Tuesday, when the guy goes with his friends or whatever, they're not paying attention to the Okay, but if the guy goes with his friends and he's satisfying his social aspect of health, is that a bad thing? No, it's not. No. But remember, the truth is in the triangle. Here are the friends, and here's couple A and couple B, or person A and person B, just to piggyback on your example. So you're the girl, and the guy goes with, out with his friends. The friend is on the tip of the triangle, right? That's the problem. What do you have to give yourself? Time with my friends. Time with your friends. You have to give yourself, and then what do you have to give each other? Time for each other. Time for each other. You see how the truth is always in the triangle, no matter what it is? So can you put your inner child tantrum here? Totally. So what do we have to do with couples. Once obviously the person is whole and they have awareness around their inner child, this is why this is so nice. And you can actually do a chart that's called a combined chart, where it's the two people in one wheel. It's like if they were really one whole person and you can find the fifth house on there. And that's going to be what they each have to give themselves and, and to one another. But you give each person individual or you get each client's chart before they even walk in, you already know how each individual inner child shows up. And so Chi Chi's pissed off that, you know, Mr. Wonderful over here doesn't buy her flowers. Is she in the right? She's a cusp of Taurus, of course. Her inner child is pissed that she didn't get flowers or a better expensive dinner or a new outfit. Are you kidding me? How does this translate into practice? How does this translate into a relationship? You have two people in your office. They both have an inner child. They both have needs that aren't met. And now they come to you because they're fighting. You do the I, I, and the we, but how does this part about tracking your needs, how can you use this with your clients? Can't you sit them both down and like ask them each what their needs are, and then they can come together and have like a meeting? Okay, anyone in a relationship here? Mm -hmm. I'm talking to someone. <laughs> She's talking to someone. She is in rapport. <laughs> She's in rapport building. She's talking. I, tried I love that. Because it's so funny that most people these days aren't talking. They're texting. Yeah. So instead of talking, you're really texting. That's but, not talking. But we say talking. And but here's the thing. That's what I wanted to ask you. The dude that I'm talking to, right? I feel like he's that parasite. Because now he's talking, mind you, we just met like 
like a couple months ago, like maybe February or so of last year. And within that time frame to now, he already wants to get married. He wants to have kids with me. Like, I'm like, dude, you still live with your mom. How about where's the house?